Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know we all want to thank Dr. Shrimplin for uh, treating you to an extra lecture today, which I know you'll all be delighted to. And I do apologise for um, getting here late. We, um, rail track need to do some thinking. Anyway, it is a great pleasure to give you this second lecture. And as you can see from this, um, the second lecture really deals with this question about how we evaluate evidence, how we try and judge whether one way of thinking might be better than another. I think one of the points I want to try and make is that one of the things about science is that this is so important. Science is trying to say what is the best way of making sense of the world. But I think there's also that element in religion as well. And so we might look at this quote from C.S. Lewis that I think many of you will know, where Lewis is really saying that, at least in his perspective, um, there is this sense-making capacity to the Christian faith. And this is the quote from Lewis, which is actually on his memorial stone in Westminster Abbey, if you want to go and see it. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Now, I want to make a point that there's a lot more to religion, to Christianity, than simply making sense of things. Um, I think we might talk about uh, the importance of, uh, of a sense of awe in the presence of God. We might talk about more effective or emotional sides of faith, and certainly that's very important. But for our purposes today, I do want to focus on this sense-making side of things, partly because it makes it easier to do this comparison between science and faith, and also because it makes this lecture manageable. So here's a quote from William James, the Harvard psychologist, who I think is really interesting. He's writing back in 1902, and he's commenting on the way in which religious faith seems to posit some unity behind the appearances of the world. Religious faith, he writes, is basically faith in the existence of an unseen order of some kind, in which the riddles of the natural order may be found and explained. And James there, I think, is hinting at two things. He's hinting at explicability. In other words, that this helps us to make sense of things. It allows us to begin to see why this can be you know, rationally um, appreciated. But a point James is also making is that it's interconnected, that it's not just a random jumble of ideas, that in some way there's a deepened pattern underlying this. And certainly I think this is very important. And certainly in my own case, I would say this is a very important part of faith. It also mattered, I think, to some of the religious writers who I think many of you will know. And I'm thinking here of Dorothy L. Sayers, who's Lord Peter Wimsey novels, I'm sure you've spent many a happy hour with. And she, she discovered Christianity, and the thing that drew her to it was this, this sense it offered, well, here's her, here's her words, the only explanation of the universe that was intellectually satisfactory. But I think she was worried about this because it seemed to her that she reduced her faith to that one point. And there's a very famous letter she wrote about 1940 to William Temple, who was then Archbishop of Canterbury, saying, I'm worried I may have, I quote, fallen in love with an intellectual pattern. And I think the point that Sayers is trying to make is that while there are many aspects to faith, this is one of them. This was the one that absolutely preoccupied her at that time in her life. I think we need to say that there are imaginative and aesthetic dimensions to faith as well. But there are other writers who would want to disagree. I think it's very important to be aware of this. In my own case, I emphasize the way in which I think religious faith does try to make sense of things. But there are significant writers who would say that they, this is not the case. And the example I'm going to quote is Terry Eagleton. Many of you have read Terry Eagleton. He's a very readable writer. He talks a lot about cultural theory, about politics, about the interaction of religion and science and society. But he basically was very, very critical of anyone who said religion tries to explain things. He writes, Christianity was never meant to be an explanation of anything in the first place. It's rather like saying that thanks to the electric toaster, we can forget about Chekhov, which I think is a very nice little idea. And Eagleton suggests that believing that, I quote, religion is a botched attempt to explain the world is about as helpful as seeing ballet as a botched attempt to run for a bus. And having just had to run for a taxi, I can relate to that very, very easily. Now, I want to make the point that Eagleton is surely right here. He's surely right to say that, um, that Christianity is more than an attempt to make sense of things. And certainly, he would want to place the emphasis elsewhere. But I think for our purposes today, we're going to follow people like Dorothy L. Sayers, and just open up this explanatory element and see how well it works. So here's a writer who some of you will know, it's Simone Weil, who um, 
basically uh, was a French writer. She uh, was very heavily involved in workers' movements in the um, 1930s. And she began to get interested in religion. And she here tries to explain what it is about religion that really drew her in. And it's very much a personal testimony, and she's trying to find an analogy which opens up this question of how, how it makes sense of things. And she uses the analogy of a torch. If I light up an electric torch at night out of doors, I don't judge its power by looking at the bulb, but by seeing how many objects it lights up. The brightness of a source of light is appreciated by the illumination it projects upon non-luminous objects. And she writes, as you can see, that the value of a religious or spiritual way of life is appreciated by the amount of illumination thrown upon the things of this world. Now, she doesn't really calibrate exactly how this might work, but she's trying to say that follow through that analogy of seeing things at night. And that gives you a sense of this idea of being able to make sense of things. I think it allows us to say that maybe the best theory, the best way of looking at things, is likely to be the one that fits in observations and experiences most elegantly, most simply, most comprehensively, and most fruitfully. And again, those of you who have background in the sciences will know that's very much what a scientist is trying to do in assessing a theory. How well does it fit in the observations? There, what really matters, the theory is judged by how reliably it's able to fit those in. Now, Lewis, um, C.S. Lewis, I think, developed this idea in some very interesting ways. You may know that Lewis began his life as an atheist. He changed over to Christianity probably around 1930. But he, he wrote a passage in an unpublished manuscript in which he talks about his reason for changing. And he wrote these words, I am an empirical theist. I arrived at God by induction. And what he seems to mean by that is that he, he didn't really find deductive proofs of God's existence very interesting. But this inductive approach, this empirical approach, which is very much about saying, here are potential theories, here is the world of experience around me, how good is the mapping between the theory and the observation? For Lewis, that seems to have been the thing that really brought him home. Now, I'd like to say Lewis is original here, but I have to be honest and say I think he may have borrowed this idea from G.K. Chesterton, a writer who I'm sure many of you will know, the Father Brown novels, and of course, many other really interesting writers. And Chesterton wrote a very famous newspaper article in 1903. It's called The Return of the Angels, which is a very evocative title. And he says, look, in this article, I'm trying to explain why, after a period of absence, so to speak, I've come back to religious faith. And this is why I think did it for me. He says, it's because it's an intelligible picture of the world. And Cheston tries to use visual analogies to, to help us understand what he means by that word intelligible. And he says, look, here's the analogy I'm going to offer. The best way, he writes, to see if a coat fits a man is not to measure both of them, but to try it on. And the point he's really making is that you judge a theory by how well it fits in observations and experience. And you know, that, that seems to me to be a reasonably good way of thinking about science. But Chesterton was very, very clear. It was also good in dealing with religion. This is a quote from this newspaper article in which he tries to explain what this is all about. Numbers of us have returned to this belief. And we return to it not because of this argument or that argument, but because the theory, when it's adopted, works out everywhere. Because the coat, when it's tried on, fits in every crease. We put on the theory like a magic hat. And history becomes translucent like a house of glass. Now, as you read that or as you hear me read that to you, I think there are many questions that will go through your mind. One that goes through my mind is, uh, does it really fit in every crease? Surely there are points of tension. Surely there are points where the fit is, you know, maybe adequate but not precise. But the, theory of this the, the whole theme of this lecture is about theory, evidence, intelligibility. And Cheston there is trying to explain how he understands these ideas. You test a theory by fit. And the analogy he uses for fit is putting on a hat or a coat or something like that. And it's very easy to understand. Uh, there may be issues that we may want to discuss further, but it is, I think, quite interesting.
But for me, I think the most interesting thing about this quote is the way in which he says, look, it's not this theory or that theory, as if it was this individual argument or that individual argument. It's cumulative. It's lots of things coming together. And what Cheston really is doing is giving you a broad-based account of the evidential basis of faith. It's lots of things coming together that, in effect, a big picture of reality is held together by many things. It doesn't just rest on one or two things. And that's very characteristic of Chesterton. Uh, Chesterton argues that individual observations of nature don't prove that Christianity is true, but rather Christianity validates itself by its ability to make sense of those observations. And Chesterton says something which I, I keep coming back to because I think it's quite interesting, and I'm going to read it to you and ask you what you make of it. The phenomenon, he writes, does not prove religion, but religion explains the phenomenon. I'll read that again. The phenomenon does not prove religion, but religion explains the phenomenon. And Chesterton is really saying, that whether you're talking about science or religion, it's not as if um, you see these things and they prove this scientific theory or this religious idea. It's that religion explains a phenomenon. That in effect, it gives you an intellectual framework, which when you look at it, seems to bring things into focus, seems to make a lot more sense of them than might otherwise be the case. And you can see that I'm beginning to open up this question of what proof actually means, whether it's something that's universal or whether actually it may have a slightly limited application. It is, I think, a very important point because one of the most interesting issues in science and religion concerns the nature of proofs of theories. And you know, the question I'm going to really explore is, you know, what are the grounds of these beliefs? What sort of things move us to saying, I think this is right rather than that right? And certainly, when I was uh, growing up in the 1960s studying science at high school, I went on to Oxford to study science in more detail, I was encouraged to think that science proved its findings with total conviction. And you know, there is some truth in that. And the chemical formula of water is H2O, and that is, that is just right. Um, but it's, it's more complex than that, because there are other theories which are much more difficult to, to say they are proved than you might think. Richard Dawkins is very clear that sciences are strong in evidence, something, incidentally, I agree with him completely for me. That's one of the enormous strengths of the natural sciences. Uh, religious faith, he thinks, is, I quote, blind trust in the absence of evidence, even in the teeth of evidence. And I, I think I, I would want to just open this question up for further discussion. He seems to be saying, in effect, science is about 100% proof, religion is about 0% truth, or indeed running away from evidence. But it might be good to look at a, a passage from Dawkins, which I think makes this point very, very well. And this is from a passage from The Selfish Gene, written back in 1976. And there's a lot of good stuff in this, but there are points where I think we need to look more closely. Faith, he writes, is a state of mind that leads people to believe something, it doesn't matter what, in the total absence of supporting evidence. If there were good supporting evidence, then faith would be superfluous, for the evidence would compel us to believe it anyway. And I'm sympathetic. I mean, I mean the evidence for water being H2O is, is compelling, and that, that is one of the reasons why I have no difficulty in accepting it. But there are cases where it's not quite that straightforward. And you might like to look at this phrase in the middle of the quote, the total absence of supporting evidence. Supposing we rephrase that, the absence of totally supporting evidence. Now, where would that take us? What I'm saying to you is that in science, very, very often, you are faced with several possible ways of explaining observational evidence. And none of them compel you to any particular theory. So you've got to try and figure out which of these theories might be the best explanation, recognizing that there are clear reasons for saying this might be right or that may be right. And so you might say it might be the most elegant theory or the most productive theory, but there are points where there are clear issues. 
And a classic example here, I think, would be this modern debate about whether there is a universe or whether there's a multiverse. And many of you will know this from your reading contemporary cosmology. Where, in effect, you're saying that the particular some mathematical equations which relate to the early history of the universe are open to be, interpreted, to be interpreted in a number of different ways. One of which is simply, there is one universe, this universe we know. The other, there's a raft of universes, a so-called multiverse, and we are just one universe amongst many. And as I said, the evidence is open to both interpretations, and so to speak, you have to make a judgment as to which is right. I think the point I'm emphasizing here really is that the notion of proof, I think, rigorously, probably applies only to logic and mathematics. And I think we can prove quite easily that two and two make four, or to move slightly sideways, that the whole, W-H-O-L-E, is greater than the part. But the difficulty is in science, very often, it's not quite that simple. And some of you will have read the American scientist and philosopher Charles Peirce, uh, who used the word abduction to refer to this uh, process of generating theories. Let me tell you what Peirce says and see how you respond to it. What Peirce says is that the way that scientists work is they line up the observations. They say we see this and this and this, and then we abduct. And what he means by that is we start to generate ideas. Maybe we could look at it like this. Maybe we could look at it like that. We generate a range of possible explanations and we line them up against the evidence. And the question is, which of those seems to be the best? But Peirce's point is very interesting. He makes the point that very often the theories we develop actually aren't themselves suggested by the evidence. It's almost like, he says at one point, it's like a, an act of imagination or almost an act of inspiration whereby you suddenly see a way of looking at things that seems to fit all of these things in. Uh, we, we tend to rewrite Peirce these days. We tend to avoid that word abduction, which um, seems to have more to do with um, close encounters of a third kind. Uh, and we tend now to talk about inference to the best explanation. But it might be good to look at an example from the history of science, which I think helps us understand the issue, but also begins to map out what I think are some of the, um, some of the issues we need to engage with this. I'm going to look at Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, which came out in 1859. And in many ways, this is a, a landmark in scientific history. And Darwin developed this idea of natural selection as a way of making sense of the biological evidence. And he himself was convinced this was the best way of making sense of things. He was aware of at least two alternatives and reckoned that his approach was better on all counts. But the difficulty is he knew he couldn't prove this. Um, he, there was no, so to speak, smoking gun, no knockdown, unambiguous evidence which would conclusively and incontrovertibly compel people to accept his theory. And he knew also there were a number of big problems that at the moment he couldn't deal with. And some of you will know that one of the most important of these is the issue of what's sometimes called genetic reduction. That is to say that when you pass on your characteristics to your offspring, they'll just get diluted and lost altogether. And Darwin did not have a theory of genetics to account for that. Mendel came along a little bit later and began to help us understand that. But Darwin nevertheless said, look, this seems to me to be the best way of making sense of things. I know I can't prove it, but there are relatively few things in life we can prove. And here's what he says. He says, a crowd of difficulties will have occurred to the reader. Some of them are so grave that to this day I can never reflect on them without being staggered. But to the best of my judgment, the greater number are only apparent. And those that are real, he says, are not, I think, fatal to my theory. So what Darwin is doing there is actually being extremely honest. He's saying, look, I cannot prove this, but I've laid out the reasons for which I believe this to be right, and I'm identifying what I think are some problems. But nonetheless, this still seems to me the best option available, and I think I can trust it. 
despite these difficulties I've tried to explore. And this is a whole issue in science, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with from your general reading, which is the problem of an anomaly, an anomaly, which is something that doesn't quite fit the theory. And the issue always is going to be, is this anomaly simply something that is irritating, that may disappear as the theory is developed further, or is it actually a sign that the theory might be wrong? And certainly in the natural sciences, on the whole, people are prepared to live with anomalies, providing they feel there is a good chance that these might be sorted out. So what I'm suggesting to you is that both in science and in faith, there's this, there's this quest for the best big picture. You observe, you experience, you stand back and try to work out how you make sense of these various observations and experience. And the psychologist William James, who I mentioned a moment ago, used a nice phrase to try and capture this method. He talked about forming, I quote, working hypotheses, working hypotheses. In other words, for the moment, we'll work with the idea it's like this, and hopefully, if we've got this right, more and more evidence will appear that will fit in with this theory, and if not, well, we'll have to go and try another working hypothesis. But James was, I think, very much aware of a point which I think is very relevant to this lecture this morning, which is that science actually moves on. And that means that you might believe one thing at one point in time, but then either because the theories have changed or more evidence has built up, you might find yourself believing something quite different in 20 or 40 years' time. And the real difficulty if you're a scientist is that you can't look ahead by 20 years and, and, in effect, predict what people are going to think that far down the line because new methods, new evidence will be around and it may mean that the theories that seem very secure today seem a lot less certain in the future. We just don't know which theories will be shown to be right and which, in effect, are shown to need, need revision. Now, I'm not for one moment suggesting that science is all over the place, that science is kind of locked in some kind of relativism, you just believe what you want, that's clearly very, very far from the truth. But there is this issue of provisionality. And it's addressed by Michael Polanyi in a book that I think many of you will know, in his book Personal Knowledge, which dates back to 1958. Polanyi tries to explain the dilemma he finds himself in as a scientist. And in effect, he, he, he lays out the point that scientific theories have changed over history and they will change again. And he knows perfectly well what scientific theories he believes to be right at the moment. And he also knows that some of those in a generation's time will be shown to be wrong or in need of radical revision. The difficulty is he doesn't know which are which. And Polanyi tried to articulate this view, which may seem a little bit indefensible, but actually I think it is a very realistic account of the dilemma many scientists face. He said, therefore, what I have to do is simply trust where I am today, but just know that I may have to give up on some of those things. And it's not as if I'm being inconsistent, I'm just being absolutely realistic about the past history and future prospects of the natural sciences. Uh, he argued that science needed to be thought of as personal knowledge, by which he meant it wasn't absolutely certain, yet it was still capable of eliciting justified belief. And I think that is important. Paul Anya is just saying, look, we have to make judgments. I believe this to be right for the following reasons, but I realize I may be shown to be wrong. And I cannot do anything about that. That's just the nature of science. It's also what human nature is like. And Paul Anya just found himself having to say, let us be realistic and judge in these ways. So we have a difficulty here in that we just don't know which of today's theories are going to be discarded as interesting failures by future generations. But most scientists I know, and I'm sure the same would apply to the ones you know, don't see this as being a big problem. Uh, Carl Sagan, for example, uh, sees the correctability of science as one of its chief virtues. When we say we've got something wrong, 
we say so. And I agree with him completely. That is one of the enormous strengths of science. Science is a method, not a fixed body of data. And if I could depart from my script, one of the things that worries me a little bit is, um, is how science is taught in schools. Very often it is taught as if it's a fixed body of data. Scientists have established this and this and this. And kids don't really understand it's a method which in the future may lead you to say, well, we used to think that, but we don't think that anymore for the following reasons. I think there's a need to really emphasize the nature of science as a method. So let's, let's, let's ask a really difficult question here. The question I'm going to ask you is, is Darwin's theory of evolution right? Now, I'll tell you what I think, and, and you, know, you can tell me what you think afterwards. I think that what we can say is that Darwin's theory, as, of course, modified by his successors, who kind of way um, did a lot of fine-tuning on it, is presently the best explanation of a vast body of biological data. But I'd also just have to say that I cannot speak for what is going to happen in the future, and that may be what the scientific consensus of today is, but it may prove to be something that is not seen as the consensus in the future. And many of you will know the very famous uh, theory of Thomas Kuhn, uh, a sociologist who was very interested in the theory, history of science, who introduced the phrase paradigm shift. We used a lot, paradigm shift. And what he meant by that is that when you look at scientific theories, what you find is very often is a period of what he calls normal science, in which uh, a theory is widely accepted, it seems settled, and then evidence begins to build up, which at some point leads you to a tipping point, where people say, no, we used to think that it can't be right, we've got to find something better. We need a new way of looking at things, or to use Kuhn's term, a paradigm shift. And you can see that in religion as well. Uh, you can see it in the New Testament, for example. Uh, the idea that a radical rethinking of existing ideas about God are forced, really, by certain aspects of the history of, of Jesus of Nazareth. And that would be an interesting lecture in itself, but I haven't time for that. Back to the question, is Darwinism right? Here's what Richard Dawkins thinks, and Dawkins and I disagree on some things, but this, I think, is, is, is right. I think he's just put his finger on what the real issue is. Darwin may be triumphant at the end of the 20th century, but we must acknowledge the possibility that new facts may come to light, which will force our successors of the 21st century to abandon Darwinism or modify it beyond recognition. Now, I, I think he is right. Um, I think those of you who are up with the biological literature will know there's a lot of rethinking going on. Um, the question really is whether that, that is going to force us to abandon this paradigm. Much more likely, I think, is to continue to work within this theory, but perhaps modifying it significantly at points. But the point Dawkins is making is fair. Any scientist just has to say, we live with a degree of uncertainty. This is what we believe to be right, but in the future, we may have to move on. So that naturally, I think, leads us into the whole question of religious beliefs. Is there any way of, of setting these side by side with scientific theories? How can we begin to look at these? And obviously, I've been talking in very general terms about um, how you might think of faith as making sense of things. But I think you, you would regard it as being very appropriate if I were to spend a little bit of time talking about arguments for the existence of God. And I'm going to tell you that I personally don't rate these very highly. Um, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I mean, I'm not saying belief in God is irrational. I'm just saying that some of these arguments do seem to me to have a lot of loose ends, but they are nonetheless very interesting. And so what I'm going to do, if I may, is just look at three very, very briefly to give you an idea of what some of the ideas are. And the first of these is what is famously called the cosmological argument. And you find this in Thomas Aquinas. Um, Aquinas basically argues that when you look at the universe, you see, you see changes. You see things moving. And Aquinas argues that wherever there is a change, there has to be something that causes that change. And therefore, as you probably know, he develops this idea that everything that we observe within the cosmos at the moment 
is caused by something, which in turn is caused by something, which in turn is caused by something. And unless we're going to have an infinite regression, you have to stop this at some point. And Aquinas says that something is, of course, God. Now, there are lots of problems with this, even though I concede it's very, very interesting. Let me just mention some of the problems. Problem number one, why, why, why couldn't there just be an infinite regression? Well, actually, I think the whole, the whole rethinking of the origins of the universe actually suggests it has to stop somewhere. So in many ways, Aquinas' argument is a slightly stronger position today than it might have been a century ago. But there are other issues which I think we need to note. I'll just mention two. Number one, why does this argument lead just to one God? Might not lead to a number of prime unmoved movers. You know, I mean, all Aquinas are saying, well, for the sake of elegance and simplicity, we say there's just one, and I do appreciate that point. But it just seems to me that actually he is unable to eliminate the idea of a multiplicity of these things. It's more or less an act of faith rather than a rigorous logical demonstration. And a question which became very important during the 18th century was this. Um, I mean, in, in our house back home, I have some very nice things that were designed and made by people in the 19th century. And the people who made them are dead. I mean, what, is, what reasons might Aquinas give for saying that whoever it was that kick-started the universe is still here? Uh, it's an interesting question, because if you read uh, writers of the 18th century, they would say, well, maybe God started the universe off, but that doesn't mean that God continues to be involved, or indeed that God is still there. He might have retired, to use a phrase Thomas Hobbes uh, gives us in Leviathan. So there, you know, there, there's some interesting questions there. If Aquinas were here, he, he would probably try and defend himself by saying, look, I, I'm not trying to prove this. So although people talk about Aquinas' proofs, Really, they're not actually proofs in the strict logical sense of the word. It's much more saying there is a resonance between what religious people think and the way the world is. And that's reassuring, but it doesn't actually count as proof in the strict sense of the word that those of you who are mathematicians or logicians would use. So there are, I think, some very interesting points there. My own feeling is that... Um, the, the recent uh, debates in cosmology do open up this whole question again, and we might need to rephrase or recalibrate or even re-express Aquinas' ideas. But certainly, these ideas continue to linger as being, I think, quite significant in our culture. The second argument is one I don't think you will have heard of. It's the Kalam argument, K-A-L-A-M. And this, in effect, is from Islamic scholars, and it's a slightly different approach. In effect, it's, um, it, is, it is in effect an argument that goes like this. It says everything that began must have a cause, that the universe began to exist, therefore the beginning of the universe must have been caused by something, and that must be God. Now, it sounds like a cosmological argument, but actually it's slightly different. And in the, the fuller version of this lecture, which you will have printed out for you, you will see uh, some of the issues there for you to consider. But the basic argument is this, that you can't just say things happen. You have to say in some way they are cause. You have to be able to give an explanation of the origination of things. And so this way of thinking has obviously been modified down the ages, but it's come back in quite a big way with, um, the, with the movement away from what we might call a steady-state model of the universe towards a Big Bang. And this is William Lane Craig, an American philosopher, talking about how he sees this argument. He thinks it's basically right, uh, and he writes like this. Since everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence, and since the universe began to exist, we conclude, therefore, the universe has a cause of its existence. Transcending the entire universe, there exists a cause which has brought the universe into being. Now, there's a certain logical neatness to that. But uh, I would want to raise some questions. One would be that, actually, maybe when, we come, when we're thinking about the origins of the universe, we are in slightly different territory and explaining how, for example, this glass of water came to be lifted. And one of the real issues is that that's, many scientists would say to you, look, we just can't go behind the Big Bang because we don't understand the mechanisms which lie behind it. We know how it works afterwards, 
but it's extremely difficult to even think about going behind it. So I think we want to be a little bit cautious there. But the third argument I'm looking at very briefly is what's called a teleological argument. And this is one that I think is very easy to understand. It's sometimes called the argument from design, and it's thought by many to be one of the most interesting arguments for the existence of God. And Aquinas uses this argument. He says, look, things don't just exist. They seem to exist for a reason. And this begins to open up the question of purpose, of directionality, a whole series of things in the universe. One of the most interesting uh, accounts of this is a book that some of you will know by a man called William Paley, P-A-L-E-Y, written in 1802. It's called Natural Theology. And Paley, in effect, argues that when you look at the intricacy of the natural world, then it can't just have happened. You know, uh, the human eye is so complex that there seems to be a need to propose someone who designed it. Now, Paley was based up in the northwest of England. He was very excited about the Industrial Revolution, and he was very interested, like many men, in machines. And he said, look, this, look at complicated machines like uh, spinning looms and things like that. These are designed and they are constructed. Um, doesn't the world look like that? And he gives lots of examples, again, the human eye being the best example. And what Paley is arguing is that when you look at the world, you see evidence of design. Now, Richard Dawkins, I think, would raise some very big questions about that. Uh, Dawkins would say that what Paley regarded as being evidence of design is simply the appearance of design, and you can account for these things by um, purely biological mechanisms. And I want to um, agree with that point. I think Paley is locked into a way of thinking which is actually quite um, difficult. But I think uh, David Hume raised some difficulties about this general approach, which remain important today, whether you think that um, Paley is right or wrong. So what I'm going to do, if I may, is just mention, I think, three arguments which I think Hume would make, which, um, which just make us pause as we try and evaluate the argument from design. First of all, Hume makes the point that you don't really observe design in the world. What you do is you observe certain things which you then interpret as evidence of design. Design is an interpretation of what you observe. There's a very interesting parallel, incidentally, in modern science, which is looking at uh, early hominins, uh, early, early predecessors of human beings, who very often constructed tools from stones, you know, uh, axe heads and things like that. If you go to Neanderthal burial sites, you will, find, you will find lots of stones and then things that look like stones but might be more than that. And the question you have to ask is, how can we tell what is just a stone and what is a tool? How do you decide which has been designed? Because design there means taking a piece of rock and doing something with it. And again, it's quite a difficult judgment to make, but you can see that's very important judgment in some aspects of modern science. But Hume's point is that, first of all, design is not something you observe, it's something you, you infer. And that you might well say there's evidence of design, but that doesn't necessarily establish a secure logical link between design in nature and a design-producing being. And he was just saying that, that, that there are a lot of dotted lines there that really do need to be filled in. I don't think he himself saw that as being absolutely impossible, but he certainly was skeptical about some of the statements of this approach he had seen. He also makes the point, which I mentioned earlier, which is uh, that this idea of an infinite regression does need to be looked at. If you're saying we can track back from what we observe in the universe to a God who is a cause of all these things, then we do have to ask why we can't have an infinite regression. For Hume, it's not a logical impossibility. I think for us today, we might say that the recognition that the universe has an origin at least defines a terminus at which this must end. So maybe, maybe this is now back on the agenda, but certainly in his day and age, it was a very fair point. But the next point that Hume makes, I think, is very important. He doesn't like any analogy between the universe and the machine. 
And he doesn't like us for various reasons. And I think one of them is, I think, very obvious. One is that machines actually can be quite inelegant, whereas nature is rather beautiful. But I think the main point that uh, Hume is going to make is this. As he looks at the world, he sees a world which he believes to be deficient. And in his dialogues on natural religion, you may know he, at several points, um, suggests, when I say he suggests, there are three participants in the dialogue uh, there, and you have to figure out which of them represents Hume. But I think we're fairly sure this is Hume's viewpoint, that, that the world is so imperfect that it must have been designed by some very inferior being, perhaps a child, Hume suggests. And the point he's making is, look, uh, you know, you know, if God was going to design the world, couldn't he have done better than this? And you know, it's quite a good point. Um, and again, this is, is something which lots of religions keep coming back to. I think if I had to make a comment here, what I would say is that if you're saying this world is clearly deficient, you really need a comparator. That is to say, something you can judge it against. And for example, I, I could say that... Um, that one of my pens back home is clearly deficient compared with another one because I've run out of ink. But I do need something, something to judge it against. And the real difficulty is that this is the only world we know. So what we have to do is say, well, we can hypothetically conceive a different world and then say that this world doesn't match up to that world. But then there is the issue as to whether that world we've invented for the point, purposes of comparison actually can be used to judge our real world in that way. So again, I think there are very interesting questions there. So I think that there's another point that I'm going to make now, which is relevant, and it's quite a long quote here from a philosopher of science called Bas von Frasen. And von Frasen um, talks here about empiricism. What does he mean by empiricism? Well, basically, he's saying it, it, it's limiting yourself to what you observe and recognizing the limits that this places on you. And what he is saying here is that if you are a radical empiricist, then actually you are limited to what can be observed, and there isn't a world beyond that. So in effect, a radical empiricism would lead you in the direction of agnosticism or atheism, although Bas von Frasen would say that actually it just stops you talking about these questions altogether because it actually limits what you can say. But let's look at what he says, because it is actually very interesting. To be an empiricist is to withhold belief in anything that goes beyond the actual observable phenomena and to recognize no objective modality in nature. To develop an empiricist account of science is to depict it as involving a search for truth only about the empirical world, about what is actual and observable. And it must invoke throughout a resolute rejection of the demand for an explanation of the regularities in the observable course of nature by means of truths concerning our reality beyond what is actual and observable. So you can see immediately that, it, that he's saying, look, if you can't observe it, then just set it to one side. You can't do that. And I'd want to say that actually this, this is quite a good statement of a radical empiricism. And if it's right, then you can see immediately that final sentence says, well, you know, ditch the idea of God, because that clearly lies beyond the realm of the observable. Although some of you might want to say, well, actually it's not quite that straightforward. Uh, if you take the Christian idea of incarnation seriously, then you know, there's an interesting angle on that we could explore. But I do want to say to you that this is quite difficult to sustain. And what I'd like you to do, if, if you would, is just to think about Newton's idea of gravity. Newton, you'll remember, um, noticed that um, there are apples falling from trees. That may be legendary, but uh, it's part of the story. And also planets going around the sun. He realized you could link these observations together if there were a thing called gravity, which in effect meant that mass attracted mass. And the difficulty he had was he could not touch, see, smell, do anything to actually show this was there. It was a hypothesis. And as those of you who are scientists will know, many times you invoke a hypothesis basically because you need this to make sense of what you see. And the classic example, I think, would be dark matter, where in effect you say we can only observe a small amount of the matter in the universe because the theory says it's much bigger than this, we're going to observe this amount, therefore we have to hypothesize 
that there's this thing called dark matter that we can't see. So I'm going to end this lecture by just talking very briefly about another argument which is very accessible, and that's C.S. Lewis's argument from desire, which he sets out in a number of writings, and I'm not going to discuss this in detail. What I will say is the full version is going to be given to you as you leave, and so you can amplify my very brief comments now by looking at this. Lewis is saying... One of the things that any theory has to explain is human experience. Why do we experience certain things? And one of the things that Lewis says is very important to experience is a sense of longing within human nature. And here's an example of this from Bertrand Russell. There's Bertrand Russell just talking in a letter of 1917 about his own inner experiential world and the the tensions he experienced. The center of me, he writes, is always and eternally a terrible pain a searching for something beyond what the world contains, something transfigured and infinite, the beatific vision, God, I don't find it, I don't think it can be found, but the love of it is my life, it's the actual spring of life within me. And and Russell just found this lay beyond the realm of his experience. He, He felt drawn to something that he couldn't show was there. And his daughter, Catherine Tate, who many of you will will know, she's a well-known author, um, talked about her her father like this. Somewhere at the back of my father's mind, at the bottom of his heart and depths of his soul, there was an empty space that had once been filled by God and has never found anything else to put in it. And his father was haunted by this ghost-like feeling of not belonging in this world. Lewis's argument, basically, is to say, not this proves anything, but rather... If we take a theory, a way of interpreting this, in Lewis's case, uh, the idea that humanity is created to relate to God, and if we don't do that, there is an emptiness where there should be a presence, there is a, a sort of feeling of a vacuum where there ought to be something there, sort of Pascal's God-shaped gap, as many of you will know. And Lewis's argument is that Christian theology is able to engage this experience and at the same time show you how it can be redirected. It's a very interesting argument, and uh, well worth looking at in detail. I think I would have two issues to raise about, although I have to say I do find it quite, um, quite interesting, and indeed quite persuasive at certain points. One of them is that um, it is terribly subjective. And Lewis says that. Lewis says, look, not everybody will have these kind of experiences, but for those that do then this is something that needs to be explained. And what I'm trying to do is offer you a theoretical framework which explains what it's all about and what can be done about it. And the other thing, I suppose, which you will think about as you reflect on this argument, is actually the argument doesn't prove a thing in the strict sense of the word, but it does talk about consistency or congruence or resonance. In other words, the theory fits in or chimes in with what may be observed. And Lewis's whole method in doing this kind of thing is to say, I'm not moving from the world to God. Actually, what I'm doing is saying, here is the kind of framework that Christianity gives you. I'm going to use that to look at the world, including my own experience, and ask how well does it fit things in and brings them into focus. Now, there is much more that needs to be said, but uh, I have, I'm deeply conscious that you have been very generous in staying on to hear me, and I think, therefore, we must leave the conversation here for the present. In our next lecture, we're going to pick up on some of the themes I began to touch on when talking about origination and the Big Bang, and I hope you'll find that lecture really, really interesting. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you also to Valerie for stepping in at very short notice. Thank you.